Okay, well, welcome everybody to our third RIM Month webinar. I am Renee Wilson, the RIM Specialist here at the State Archives for State Agencies, and I'm going to talk today about archives versus record center, except it's not really a versus sort of thing, it's more of a what's the difference sort of thing. So, because um, a lot of people tend to get these too confused or mixed up, I think, because of the words we use. So what's the difference? Let me start by telling you a little bit about the archives. The archives was built in 2004, and before then we were up on the Capitol Hill, and then we moved down here to be closer to our records. No, just kidding. Um, we moved down here, and we are right next to the Division of History, so we can share a research center with them. Oh, by the way, that is my window. This is what the building looks like in the summertime, so I wanted to find a really nice summer shot, but um, you can't really see the building when the trees are there, so that's what our build, actual building looks like. So the archives has 75,000 cubic feet of storage, one box of records is one cubic foot, so that is 75,000 boxes. We just had an expansion done on our repository, so we were at 50,000 cubic feet, and we bumped it up to 75,000 cubic feet. And that was planned when we moved in in 2004. We knew that in about 15 years we would need to expand, and we did. Right now, we're using about 48,000 of those 75,000 cubic feet, which is about 64%. So we are located downtown. We are next to Pioneer Park and the Rio Grande building. And this is a looking farther out. So both the State Archives and the Record Center function under the mandate given in Utah Code Section 63A-12-101, which is to basically take care of the state's records. And that is what we do. So the archives, the records that we hold at the archives, those are all permanent records. So if you have records that are going to be destroyed, they will not come to the state archives. Let me tell you a little bit about the record center. The state record center, it's a really cool building actually. It has a great story behind it. So it was built in 1942. It's a wartime warehouse and it was a naval supply depot. So let me say that again, a naval supply depot, as in naval, as in the Navy, as in the ocean. So the reason why is because the warehouse, it was about um, equidistant from all the major seaports on the West Coast. So if there was a need, then any major port on the West Coast could be resupplied from this warehouse within about a day by rail or even shorter if they did it by air. In 2010, the federal government transferred ownership to the state of Utah, and the record center moved in 2012, which was a really massive feat to do. Uh, they had 115,000 boxes at the time, and they moved 5,200 a day. So if you'd like to make a word problem out of that and solve it for how many days it took them to move all the boxes, that would be fine. Uh, the current... Record Center it has 160,000 cubic foot capacity. And right now, about 140,000 of those cubic feet are in use, which is about 87%. It's also twice the size of the archives. So in case you have ever been to the archives and thought, wow, that's really big, uh, the record center is even bigger. They are located in Clearfield, right there. So you can see there's about 28 miles between us. So we're not actually the same building, um, but 
we, we do like each other. Um, no, so the state, if you want to have records stored at the record center, the record center is used for record storage for all state agencies. And that includes uh, local agencies, municipalities, special districts, local districts, um, any governmental entity within Utah, mostly, can store records at the record center. And the way you do this is by putting it into the format management section of a retention schedule. So right here it says to transfer records to the state record center. And since that is in there, then you can transfer records to them. Let me show you kind of the process um, flowchart of how your records move. So most people keep their records in their office and then at the end of the records lives, they will either destroy the records or send them to the archives. The record center is just an additional step that can get your records out of your office and into this space where um, you don't have to worry about them taking up your space. You can recall records from the record center. Our record center staff is amazing. Lisa and Jim and Chaz, and um, they're very good at getting you the records that you need quickly. And so the only difference here is that with records in the record center, when it comes time for destruction, we verify with you that these records are going to be destroyed, or if they're being sent to the archives, then they're sent to the archives. So that is the let me that is the the difference in using the record center. And let me put them side by side here. I think this helps me to see a little bit better the difference and talk about anything I forgot. So building location. So the archives we are here in Salt Lake City, Utah and the, the record center is in Clearfield, Utah. Storage conditions, oh yeah, there we go, that's important. So both places are secure locked buildings. You need access to get in, you need an access card. The archives though, since we're taking care of permanent records, the entire repository is temperature controlled. It's 60 degrees Fahrenheit and, or 64? Anyway, it's cold. And then the um, humidity is 40% humidity. The record center is not controlled, temperature or humidity controlled. So the records can fluctuate a little bit depending on the temperature. So the process for transferring records to the two places is for you, pretty much the same as far as filling out a transfer sheet. If you're sending records to the archives, fill out our records transfer sheet online. If you're filling out, um, if you're sending records to the record center, fill out the records transfer sheet online. And then from there, we work with you to actually get the boxes to the location that you want. We do have uh, different mailing addresses. The record center boxes going there get mailed to a P.O. box. The actual physical address of the record center we can give you, but um, no one really delivers there. They deliver to the P.O. box. So if you, and if you plan to go there in person to drop off some records, then let us know. We can definitely accommodate that, but it's not, um, it's not something where you can just walk up and and drop off your records, we need to actually plan it. So the actual records that you're sending to these places at the archives, like I said, all our, all our records that we keep are permanent. At the record center, the records can be permanent or not permanent, either one. Now, obviously you're not going to put very, very short retention records into the record center. Um, like one year or three year, but but the records can definitely be non-permanent. So one important difference between the two is also the custody aspect. 
So once records are sent to the archives, they are held in the custody of the archives, meaning that the archives is legally responsible for providing access to those records. And then, but while the records are in the record center, your agency is the agency that is responsible for providing access to the records. So I see this mostly in um, like people, members of the public or researchers wanting to access the records, or if there is a grammar request, if the records are at the archives, then the archives will be the one to respond to that grammar request. And if the, archi if the records are at the record center, your agency will be the one to respond to that grammar request. The access is also different on how to access the records. Um, the archives, we don't actually provide access in the archives building. We have a research center that we share with the history, division of history, and that's in the Rio Grande building right next door to us. And they are wonderful there. You can access a whole bunch of the state's records and historical documents and um, they're very friendly and will help you there. The record center, if you need to access those records, you can recall a box or a file from a box by using the form online. And our again, our record center staff is wonderful and very helpful at helping you to get that those records back. If you do have a big records project where you're going to have to recall a large number of boxes and look through them or resort them or something like that, then contact the record center because they may be able to help you find a different solution of you coming to the record center or um, just let them know because they're really amazing. At the, they're the record storage specialists, so they, they know how to help you get your records from the record center. And then last of all, the phone number right there, in case you are wondering. That's our general analyst line for the archives. So if you need to talk to any room specialists about setting up a retention schedule or adding the record center to your uh, retention schedule, give us a call. The record center number, if you need to plan any pickups or drop-offs or have questions about what if my box has stickers on it, anything like that, give the record center a call and they can help you out. We have a question. You can just speak it. I don't know. Can you hear me? Just talk this is the mic. Oh, we have a question from Susan Marie Lott. She is asking, just to be sure I'm understanding correctly, we can store permanent retention records at the record center and retain custody. Well, that's a really interesting question because um, you can't store permanent records at the record center permanently. Um, the record center is for temporary storage, even if that storage is like 100 years. So if you have permanent records that you want to send to the record center for about 100 years and then take back, yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, otherwise, if you do, if you have, um, and obviously if you have records that are permanent and go into the archives, you can send those to the record center for a time and then they will be sent on to the archives. But also um, give us a call or an email with your specific situation because there may be something that we can help you with or some way that we can help you. So um, yeah. So Susan goes on to say, I thought I had read something in the training that said if it was permanent custody, it would just be sent on to the main archives in Salt Lake City, but I was probably mistaken. Oh, uh, yeah, I think the confusion there is the is the words. So the custody, I think, is re should mean retention. Uh, so the permanent records, records with a permanent retention will go to the archives. A permanent custody would mean that you always have the records with you forever. I hope 
So what's, what's the process of retention ending and the... Oh, the process of re end of retention, I believe if the retention is to retain permanently, sent to archives, then at the end of the records lives at the record center, they are sent automatically to the archives. If they are going to be destroyed, then the record center will contact you and send you a list of all the boxes that they have to be destroyed and the, day, the dates upon which they will be destroyed if you do or do not uh, reply. And they need they get a signature from you saying that, yes, you can destroy these records. And then they have um, they actually have a shredding company come and pick up large shipments of boxes to be destroyed. And Susan says that that all makes sense. Uh, she she did mean retention. Oh, okay, so great. That would that clarified it. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions before I go to the tour? And I do have to tell you, while I'm waiting for questions, the tour is okay. So I filmed the tour, and I am not a videographer. So it's really um, not professional. So don't expect a professional video, but I, I did the best I could. And the thing is, it may make you seasick. So if you get motion sickness, you may want to maybe not watch or just watch the parts with the people in them or something like that. I just uh, don't want you to get sick. <laughs> And with that disclaimer, let us move on to the tour. Hopefully it works. It's going to be great. So excited. This one. Okay. So let me just... Full screen. There we go. Okay. So... The tour. We will start here with the outside of the building. This is the archives building. And as you can see, we are right next to the Rio Grande. That's the Rio Grande building. And up north, right there, is the parking lot where you can park, where we have parking out front. We do love our building. So we are not the Rio Grande building, but we are connected to the Rio Grande building by this glass vestibule, which we will be going into. So this is the part where I said about getting seasick. Um, it does get a little better, but sorry for that. So these glass doors, you don't need a pass to get through. We are to the left, history's to the right, but these doors you do need a pass to get through. So when you first walk in, you'll see this globe, this awesome globe. It stood on top of the dome of the Capitol for many years, and it was replaced in the late 1990s. As you can see, it still works, and we enjoy looking at it. Then you'll probably notice this painting here in the foyer. This is by Douglas Snow. He's a Utah artist. It's untitled and painted in 1975. I like to ask people what they see in the painting because people have different opinions on what they see. So here's just kind of a 360. There's the administrative offices, plants. We like plants. Front door, bathrooms, very important. Elevator, of course, and reformatting section. We will be visiting there later. But first, let's start with the admin offices. And our first stop on the list is Rosemary Cundiff. So, hi, Rosemary. What do you do here? I'm the government records ombudsman. And in that role, I have to be familiar with grandma so that I can help records officers respond to grandma requests and also that I can help the public in making grandma requests or appealing. And I also mediate disputes over records issues. Wow, that's a lot of stuff you do. Thanks very much, Rosemary. You're welcome. Now let's go meet our illustrious director, Ken Williams. Well, hello. How you doing? 
Oh. I'm doing great. Just Good. finished the state records committee, so I'm doing even better. <laughs> nice. So, Ken, I'm supposed to ask you about a story about the bulldozer. Oh. You stopped it? I did. I stopped a bulldozer out at the UDOT flammable storage unit that was about to load up all of the UDOT photo collection and put it in a dumpster. Oh, my. I stopped it. They've been preserved. Well, that's our amazing director. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Renee. Next, we have our Chief Records Officer, Kendra Yates. Hi, Kendra. What do Hi, you Renee. do here? Uh, I administer the Records and Information Management section, and I'm the Chief Records Officer for the state, which is just a fancy title for being the Records Officer for the Division of Archives and Records Service and uh, overseeing the records management programs for the state. Yeah, that's, that's not a big deal at all, just records management for the whole state. Okay, now we're going to go to the boardroom and uh, see if anyone's in there. Aha, it's the room specialist. Here is Rebecca, she does the general schedules, Rebecca Shaw. Hi. And then Renee Wilson helps state agents. Hi. Oh, that's me. Hi. Hi, everyone. And then Hello, everyone. Heidi helps local agencies. This is your RIM team, and we love to help you. So ask us questions. Okay, now let's head back out to the foyer where we, whoa, the globe popped on, where we will say hi, globe, and then move on to the training room. So, a lot of you have been in the training room, of course. Oh, the lights came on when I walked in. Nice. So, this is where the State Records Committee also meets. So, if you go to the State Records Committee meetings, you will go in here. Or our trainings, or we have sometimes different other meetings. So, basically a big room. There you go. <laughs> Next, we're going to see the repository. We're going sideways here. Get ready. Ready? And sideways. There we go. That door is also locked during the daytime. Well, during the all the time. All the time. So this is the automated storage and retrieval system, is what it's called. ASRS. ASRS is how we abbreviate it or, and refer to it. So as you can see, it's the height of the entire building. It's huge. And the machine moves automatically, which you will see that in a moment. In this safe here, the safe is very important. We have the state constitution and Brigham Young's probate case and other historical society documents and a bunch of secret things. Just kidding. I'm sure someone could tell you what's in there. Uh, this is the second side. We have two machines. This one is exactly like the other machine, except that it's on this side of the building. It's really fun to watch, actually. Let's watch it right now. It makes a cool sound as it whooshes away. So right now it's putting a bay of boxes away. The bays are three deep, so if the machine needs to get one out of the back, it has to move the ones in front of it before it can get the right bay. And it keeps track of all that, of course. This video is a little bit older, so it might not be as uh, high quality, but here we're going to get another bay and bring it to the loading dock. If you come in person, you can see this uh, yourself. It's really fun to watch. Well, I enjoy watching it. And lands gently in the loading area. So that's what the machine looks like when it's moving. Now let's go over to our reformatting section. door, across the foyer, 
So our reformatting section uh, basically reformat documents, as you could guess. They convert things to microfilm and from microfilm and to digital and from digital. So this first station is a um, micrographic station. So we take photographs of the records and that is how we put them onto microfilm. And then this cool thing is the digital converter. So agencies upload their digital records directly to it and then it turns them into microfilm, which I will tell you a little bit more about later. I'm not showing you the machine that changes microfilm to digital, but we do have that. Hi, Renee. Hi, Brian. Brian is our reformatting section manager and he uh, is from New York. So Brian, can you tell me what exactly it is you do here? <laughs> Uh, oversee all the aspects of the of the agent or the section. Just uh, make sure everything's rolling good and everybody gets their films on time and so forth. I run the digital film converter machine and the processing in the lab and uh, a lot of admin. Oh, thank you very much. You're and welcome. Have a good day. Okay, so now we're going into the lab. So this is where we process the microfilm. And this machine I'm going to show you takes the microfilm through a bunch of different chemical washes that processes it. And the reason we use microfilm is because it is it lasts a very, very long time and you can read it with the bare eye. So digital, there's not really a solution for yet. And for long-term preservation, microfilm is really spectacular. Obviously, it's not as easy to access as digital, but it's great for preservation. So that is why we have, um, why we convert a lot of things to microfilm so that we can preserve them permanently. Okay, next we're going to take a look at this art piece. And this was... Um, we have a comment, sorry. Susan Lott again said, I used to be a microfilmer and later did digitization. This is fun to see. Oh, good. Good, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy it. So Kana Tanaka made this. She took the shape of a box, which is a hexagon, and she took an image and then overlaid it with hexagons and then etched onto the hexagons that image and then hung them up. So this was part of a grant, received as part of a grant for the expansion that we just recently did. Um, I believe that part of each expansion is dedicated to art in the building. So we had this fund, this money that we could only use on this art. And I'm so glad we did because it does the spectacular thing around noon every day where it just shines all over. And it is really, Quite magical. So it's called a repository of collective memory. Okay, so this is the rim specialist cubicle area. That's my cubicle right there. My cubicle neighbor over here is Dylan Mace for the open records portal. He's the administrator. And my other neighbor is Gina Proctor, who is the state records committee executive secretary. And then it's pretty much just cubicle space, so I'm not really going to show you the rest of the cubicles. Another quick glimpse of the glimmers of light, because I really like it. Okay, now we're heading into processing. We're we'll first meet Kurt. Here's Kurt. Hi, Kurt. Good morning. I'm filming. Oh, hello. <laughs> Kurt is the one who uses the machine to get all the boxes. He's our awesome technician there. So this is our processing section. This is where we take the records and process them and analyze them and catalog them. Sometimes we get really interesting stuff like Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox on socks in a box. Hmm. Anyway, so yeah, we get some really fun things here. And we'll get some routine things, obviously, too. Let's meet the uh, processing manager. Hi, Jim. Great. Did you know if you record without a mic, you can't hear anything? That makes sense. So Jim is our assistant director and processing section manager. Thanks, Jim. Hello. Hmm. 
This is another fun place to walk through. You never know what you're going to find there. Well, I never know. Probably they know. Birth certificates, we have quite a lot of those. Just wanted to show you that. And now we're moving quickly, so hang on to your hats. If you get motion sick, don't look. We're going outside to the research center, which is in the Rio Grande. Um, we're going to walk past it. I will point it out to you. Here it comes. That's the research center right there. But you can't use those doors, so we have to keep going. You can't use those doors either. These are the doors you use. So, you go into the Rio Grande here, <clears throat> and again, the research center is how you access records at the archives. So even if you're a government agency, this is where you would come to access the records. <clears throat> and we do, we do uh, co, what do you, what do you call it? We work with the Division of History here, so we both use this research center. It's for both of us. It's a little bit like the Library of Congress. It's pretty cool in that um, you can't bring pens or food or drink or anything like that in. You do have to sign in, and you have to leave your belongings in a little cubby there. You can use a pencil, and that's pretty much it. We have a ton of stuff in here, though. Microfilm books, yearbooks, old city directories. Uh, the yearbooks, I think, are pretty fun because we have... Mm, we collect all the yearbooks from all the different schools in Utah. So that is the beautiful. Okay, hang on to your hats again because this is getting this is getting fast. Again, we are going to go now to the record center. So let's get to the car. This is the parking lot where you can park right here. Here we go. Here we go. Oh wow, that was a quick commute. Here we are at the record center in Clearfield, twenty-eight miles away. So again, their building is locked as well. You have to use a little call box, and then someone comes to the door to let you in. In this case, it's Chaz. Hi, Chaz, thank you. So you'll walk into this little area here, <coughs> and you do have to sign in. So we need to know who is in the building in case of an emergency so we can get you out of the building. So let's go through these doors. This first room is, this is cold storage. So this part of the record center is controlled, but the rest of it isn't. This is where we are storing our microfilm. A lot of microfilm. It's a pretty recent addition, but it helped us to have a second location to store the microfilm, <coughs> which is of course, <coughs> excuse me, a best practice to have multiple locations, multiple copies of multiple locations. So here's when you first walk in to the record center, and here's kind of just a quick turnaround of where we're at. These records, boxes that you're seeing here, these are going to the archives. So these are permanent records and have met retention and are headed to the archives. Those are the old creepy storage. Um, it's not officially called that, I just call it that myself. It's from the 40s. It's the original shelving from the 40s, which is pretty cool. So this is our current shelving here. And I just want to kind of walk you around the entire building to start with because it is bigger than you think. Because that wall there, there's more on the other side of that wall. It's just pretty big. It's a pretty big area. We'll do a quick 360 here. That blue elevator there, that is for boxes, not humans. I learned that the other day. And on this wall, look up at the top of the wall. There is a set of doors up there. Oh my goodness, what is that to? That's silly. Just kidding. That's for boxes as well, so they can hoist up pallets of boxes if they need to. Those machines are wave machines. They use them to retrieve boxes. And this is the second half of the warehouse. So yeah, it's actually bigger than the first half. And that's a lot of boxes. Those are other machines they use to get the boxes, which I took some video of, but I didn't have time to add it in. 
So I'm walking three times faster than normal in this video, just to kind of show you how long it takes to walk down this aisle, even walking three times faster, because there's just a lot of aisles of records. And it's very quiet at the record center, so I may just be quiet and let you feel the uncomfortable silence of quiet. Yeah, sorry if you're getting dizzy. I realized that turning corners, I got really dizzy when I went faster, so I had to slow those parts down. Ta-da! Boxes. Those boxes look different. You may notice those are map boxes. So if you have maps that you would like to send, you can. They just need to be in special boxes. Then we have some very cool old books from Cache County, which I will focus on for just a half second. There they are. Oversized. And then um, oversized books, yes. And then those are, these are as-built plans from UDOT. So lots of as-built plans. Now we're going into, to go into the creepy storage area. So each aisle has its own light switch. Thank you, Chaz, for turning them all on. As you can see, this is a little bit more of a tight squeeze than the other aisles. It's a little claustrophobic, actually, if you want to know the truth. The machines cannot go in this area. So we use this area for boxes that are going to be at the record center a very long time, for uh, like 50 or 100 years, because then we know we won't have to access them because these are more difficult to get the boxes in and out. Not as much room and no machines, so you have to either lift the boxes up from the high ones or use a ladder. But we do have lots of boxes up here as well. This is, this is even better of an area to be in when it's super quiet. Yeah. Okay, that was funky. Okay, let me give you a view here from the top because it's kind of cool. I think that looks like it's missing teeth. Haha, <laughs> boxes. There's that elevator again for the boxes. And now we will go down using these stairs over here. I don't know, I just think it looks kind of cool walking past all these. Um, now I'm just going through down the entire aisle so you can see how long it is and switching off all the lights on each aisle because you have to switch them off when you are done. The end of the tour. Yes, what is your question? Pat Denning asks, does the archives microfilm all permanent records? No, not all of them. I mean, it's impossible to microfilm everything. That's, that's kind of like the same as asking, um, does the archives digitize everything? So it's just, no, we don't have the manpower. We appraise, we prioritize. Yeah, we appraise we, the records. That's what the, the processing section does is they, they appraise the records and determine which are the most valuable. They have um, different ways of determining which to prioritize and which would need more access and are more historically significant, stuff like that. So they've been, they've received training on that and are professionals. Are there any other questions? Sorry, that was kind of a quick tour. I was trying to keep it short, but I hope it didn't make anyone throw up. <laughs> Okay, well, let me actually uh, point out that next week's webinar is on Tuesday rather than Wednesday.
And it is going to be a conversation about grandma with the government records ombudsman, Rosemary Cundiff, and the Open Records Portal administrator, Dylan Mace. So please, if you have any questions about the record center or archives or sending records or retentions or any of that, please give us a call. Um, I will add our information into the description so that you can actually know our contact information. But otherwise, uh, thank you very much for attending, and I hope you enjoyed the webinar, and I will see you next week.